Good afternoon and good morning to all of you who are joining this webinar from Indonesia and the UK. Welcome to UK-Indonesia English Partnership Series. Today is the second day of a three-day event organized by the British Council Indonesia and the UK Department for International Trade, DIT, as part of drive to support new UK ID ELT partnerships. We have an amazing lineup of speakers in this three-day event to share their expertise and experience between the UK and Indonesian education institutions, government agency, ELT, and EdTech companies. I'm Francis Yinanu, and I'm a board member of ITEL, Indonesia Technology Enhanced Language Learning. ITEL is helping the British Council to organize this event. I'm also teaching at the English Language Education Department at Universitas Kristen Satyawachana. I'll be your moderator for today's uh, and tomorrow's sessions. Uh, if you just join us today and you missed the first uh, day of the series yesterday, you can go to the British Council Indonesia YouTube channel to watch the recording of yesterday's session. Yesterday was the official launch of UK ID Digital Innovation Grants to support teacher professional development in schools and higher education institutions. You can click the link in the chat. I'm sure um, Ba Maria is um, giving you the link to all the YouTube uh, channel, uh, YouTube links, videos to watch the series on uh, YouTube. We are now live on YouTube and we have about almost 190 participants joining us on Zoom here. So welcome again and thank you for joining us. Today's session take the theme of sharing innovation in English language teacher professional development. We have two sessions to cover, to, to cover today's theme. The first one will be for schools and the second one focuses on higher education level. The last session of today will be the Q&A session about the UK ID Digital Innovation Grants that was launched yesterday. So if you happen to ask a question in yesterday's session, you may want to resubmit your question here for a column to address later in session three. Okay, I'm seeing people are greeting from Banten, from Chianjur, hello from Jakarta. I believe everyone is keen to start listening to our great speakers today. But before we begin, allow me to remind you uh, that this webinar is recorded and it's also being broadcasted live on YouTube. Uh, and if you have colleagues who cannot join the, U, uh, the Zoom webinar, they can always go to the YouTube uh, channel and watch it there. Um, and also, if you have questions to ask, please address your questions in the Q&A box on Zoom. And if you join via YouTube, you can also ask your question in the chat box, uh, chat box in, on YouTube. So ladies and gentlemen, let's begin the first session today. Session one is on te English teacher professional development in schools, digital innovation in professional development for pre-service and in-service English teacher. We have a big number of panelists for this session, as you can see in the poster. Our first two speakers are going to set the scene for the rest of the session. We are very lucky to have the first speaker, Ibu Icha Khodija. Uh, she has been supporting teacher professional development in Indonesia, both in the formal and informal sectors. And she's currently while working with the Ministry of Education in developing the pre-service and in-service English teacher training programs or what we call in uh, Bahasa Indonesia, the PPG. Ibu Icha, I'll give you 10 minutes to share what you uh, have to present today. Over to you, Ibu Icha. Thank you very much, Francis. Uh, so I have to speak in 10 minutes now. It's so challenging. Uh, <laughs> may I share my screen? Oh, where is my screen? Wait. Um. All right, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, I've been introduced by uh, Francis, and now I jump into the presentation to set the, the whole scene for the event today, yeah? Uh, we are looking at English teachers in Indonesia. Where are they and how they do the uh, uh, teacher development? Um, where are our Indonesian English teachers? Um, 
because my task now is dealing with schools. So now I'm looking at where are our English teachers. Uh, mainly our English teachers are in these uh, four places. Yes, uh, state schools and mainstream private schools, wealthier pri private schools, primary state schools, and in some state and mainstream private schools uh, where teachers teach the uh, uh, Peminatan program. Now let's talk about the uh, teachers who are in state schools and mainstream private schools. Yeah, uh, English in state schools and mainstream private schools are only taught in uh, lower to upper secondary school. Uh, and number of, of hours is following the regulation, 90 minutes per week in upper secondary and two times of 80 minutes in uh, per week in lower secondary. The curriculum is mainly uh, the government curriculum uh, uh, using genre based or text based. Uh, professional development for teachers, mainly through MGMP. MGMP is uh, in service professional development for subject matter teachers. So, this is, I call it teachers learning community. And self initiated professional development activities. Uh, they join. Uh, 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 seminars, webinars done by ITEL, by uh, any other organizations. Uh, and then uh, group number two, English teachers are in wealthier uh, private schools. And here, mainstream private schools, uh, in wealthier private schools, uh, they teach English from primary to upper secondary. And uh, a, a number of hours just really depend on the policy of the schools. It can be uh, every day within five days in the week, uh, they have uh, 80 minutes per day or 90 minutes per day, just depending on the decision of the school. A curriculum is decided by each school. Uh, usually uh, they use uh, national curriculum plus uh, school curricula, or they use IB curriculum or Cambridge curriculum and any other curriculum that they think is suitable uh, for their students. And in this school, teachers are well selected. They usually recruit, recruited based on their competence, especially their English competence. And in some schools, they have native English native speakers. Professional development is usually well managed by uh, the school, and 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 it's it's usually structured and 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 continuous. Now, the teaching of English in primary state school because there is no in the uh, there is no regulation that mandated uh, the teaching of English in primary school. Then the teaching of English in primary school just really depend on uh, the school decision or the local government decision. And usually it's 70 minutes uh, per week and teachers are not always recruited to teach English. Uh, sometimes they are the uh, homeroom classroom teacher. Uh, and then uh, just give the responsibility to teach English. So it's not uh, nationally practiced. Professional development activities uh, so far based on the teacher's initiative or the uh, teacher's learning community or KKG uh, initiative. Now, what about, at, uh, sorry, at, uh, 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 additional information. At school levels, the number of English teachers in lower secondary, upper secondary, and vocational high school is more than 100,000. And so far, there has not been standard level of English teachers proficiency. Um, so when they are recruited, they are not assessed um, uh, by, by the government uh, on their level of English. And therefore, professional development is more or less, I could say, challenging. Now, talking about professional development, where 
and how do professional development activities are carried out so far? So uh, professional development so far are carried out for the practicing teacher, for practicing teacher, the, uh, the, uh, 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 the medium or the uh, uh, professional development activity is done through the MGMP. What is MGMP? Subject Matter uh, Teachers Community. Uh, this one is mandated by the government. So in each school, there has to be MGMP and each uh, sub-district, in each district, municipal, uh, municipality and, and in cities, uh, there has to be uh, this uh, learning community of, of, of subject matter teachers uh, for lower and secondary and vocational high school teachers. This is mandatory. So uh, this why this is the chance uh, actually for us uh, to help teachers to do the professional development. And then uh, another one, which is only also mandated is the PPG, Professional Teacher Education, Pendidikan Profesional Guru for the practicing teacher. Uh, well, actually uh, in, in, a, in a broader terms, we call it in-service training, yeah? Uh, but, um, for some reasons in Indonesia, they call it professional teacher education. And this has to be followed by all Indonesian practicing teacher who are not certified yet. So the main purpose of this in-service training or PPG dalam jabatan is actually to get the teacher certified. And it is conducted by universities. And since March, 2020, uh, it's totally online and, and, and they are adapting the curriculum and, and the module and the practice. Curriculum is centralized, developed by the Ministry of Education, uh, higher education. And then uh, the duration is 58 days, including individual learning. So uh, 58 days online and uh, offline. Uh, it is mandated by national regulation that all teachers should pass this PPG program in order to be certified. Again, I would like to add that certified doesn't mean always qualified or more qualified. And then uh, these two, uh, the MGMP and PPG are for practicing the practicing teachers. And then the uh, PPG Prajabatan, Prajabatan is before, so this is included in the pre-service. Uh, now it is mandated for those who are graduated from the BAD degree, whether uh, from a, a, a teacher college or any other universities. And, and the duration is two semesters, and this is uh, now being transformed, being uh, the government is developing the new model uh, of this uh, PPG Prajabatan. Curriculum is centralized and now is being transformed into hybrid learning. Uh, before uh, it was uh, on, uh, it was offline, face to face. And it's, that's why it's challenging for teachers who are in remote areas. And then another area for professional development, of course, are, um, is done by uh, many agencies, private agencies, private organizations uh, who provide uh, professional uh, development activities. And it is usually based on the individual or school initiative. Now, uh, what can be improved in the future? MGMP, uh, when national exams still exist, uh, usually uh, they, they, their activities focus more on developing test items, uh, developing uh, materials to help the students pass the exam, etc. Uh, but I think now they have to change the direction because national uh, exam uh, has uh, has been stopped uh, since uh, last year. 
and and make the MGMP become a real professional learning communities for English teachers, because this is mandatory. It is un, uh, based on uh, regulation. And then the second one in a PPG dalam jabatan, the in service should prioritize more on improving teachers' English competencies and adapting their modules in, in, in pedagogical content knowledge and the use of technology. Because I think uh, we all know uh, how technology can scale up uh, quality and quantity. And then for the PPG Prajabatan, the pre-service, they have uh, to design their module to suit the needs, the, the new innovation by the government, the Merdeka Belajar, the Curriculum Merdeka. Uh, so uh, here, this is the moment where, uh, when the, uh, the government is doing a lot of uh, redesigning, transforming, the model of this uh, PPG. And I think for this two, again, I repeated that these two, even though it is initiated by the government, by the Ministry of Education, uh, uh, this, these two are done in universities. And my suggestion, uh, there has to be, I mean, they have to provide micro learning uh, modules, which I think I'm sure uh, uh, universities needs lots of uh, efforts and, 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 and ideas for their micro learning modules. And then they also need to provide English self-assessment for all teachers. And the last one is improving their learning management system. And I think uh, this, uh, I mean, uh, this is how we can improve the quality of uh, professional development. Thank you so much. Back to Francis. Thank you so much, Iwija. I know it's impossible to make uh, all of, um, what you presented in 10 minutes, but thank you so much for your time and for sharing that uh, to set the scene for the um, context in Indonesia. Thank you so much, Ibu Iche. And now we're going to move to see how is the context in, in the UK. And allow me to introduce uh, the next speaker, uh, Mark Hanabury. Mark is the UK government sector specialist ELT um, from the Department for International and Trade, to International Trade. So similar to Ibu Iche, Mark will have 10 minutes to present his talk. Before we go on to the panel of UK um, ELT providers later in this session. Is Mark here? Hi, Mark. Hello. I am. Okay. Hi, good afternoon. Hello. Um, pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Francis, for the introduction. I'm just attempting to share my screen with you all at the moment, okay. um, but not having a lot of success this morning. I'm not sure if perhaps you could do it um, from your end. Okay, um, so. Okay, I'll just do you want us to share your screen, or your slide? If you could, okay. if, you, if you have it ready, please. All right, let me check. If not, don't worry too much because I don't want to take up too much time uh, from all of the presentations that are going on today. Um, firstly, just like to say thank you all very much for inviting me along today to give me an opportunity to explain um, a bit about the UK ELT sector to you. Um, you've got an absolutely fantastic uh, session lined up today. Brilliant speakers, you're gonna enjoy it a lot. I encourage you to, to listen, ask questions um, and engage with the, with the participants after the event as well. So I don't think we're able to get my presentation. It's not a problem. What I wanted to 
um, give you an overview of of uh, was what the UK ELT sector look like. So uh, and and why the UK is is um, such a good partner for working with together on ELT, and it really comes down to to five essential pillars. The UK has always been the number one destination for people to to come to learn English traditionally. Now, because of that, you've got a, a whole industry that's set up around it. You've got experienced schools that develop their own specialisms and their own courses to to target different types of students, whether that be junior students, whether that be professional students, uh, whether that be students wanting to learn English for a specific purpose, whatever it might be. You've got this industry that's grown up around that. Now, to support that industry, obviously, you've got teachers that have got themselves very well qualified to get the best jobs within that industry. Um, they, you know, you, you, um, you'd look at continuous professional development for your teachers that's embedded into the system oh wonderful my presentation is there um so it's looking at teachers are never standing still they're always developing their their um their expertise and their techniques and the uh, the the um whatever they're using in the classroom their approaches to teaching this is never never sitting still um, and of course, that, that goes around that is all of the research and literature that supports the industry, all of the teacher training, um, all of the uh, research into how students learn languages, all of the great work that universities, schools and colleges are doing around the UK in this area. And then we've got very robust quality assurance in the UK. So in terms of regulating what the schools are doing, now that could be down to what the teacher's doing in the classroom. So having the teacher observed and, and seeing how they, 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 uh, they approach their lessons and what elements they bring into their lessons. It could be to do with the management structure, the resources, the library, and the care of students within the institution as well. So all of these things are really robustly inspected and, and analyzed as well. And what that does is, that also develops a, a, um, a system of competition within the schools. So they, they're always competing against schools in the same area. So again, they're really focusing on driving their inspection reports, driving their quality insurance, um, developing their teachers. And adaptability is the last pillar. And that's really been key over the past couple of years in terms of how our schools, how our, our colleges have managed to survive the the COVID crisis, and it's been it's been really tough. We're, we're a sector that that um, would usually be heavily reliant on students coming to the UK. Of course, we work with with countries around the world and institutions around the world and partners. Um, but this adaptability, this is this has been key to the survival of of institutions in the UK, and something that that's going forward as well. And we're going to take with us. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So um, we often think of English language teaching as being the, the bit in the middle, the rectangle boxes in the middle, the actual institutions that do the teaching, whether it's language schools, universities, colleges, and they all got slightly different angles in terms of what they would focus on. So colleges might focus on more um, vocational English training, for example, whereas universities, HE institutions, it may be more academic English training, for example. And language schools, independent schools, they would have different areas of focus as well to cater for different students, as I mentioned. But of course, that's that's not the sector. The sector is much wider than that. And the bit around the outside in the red ovals, that's actually a larger part of what the ELT sector is in the UK. It is publishing. It is qualifications and tests. It is quality assurance, as I mentioned. Teacher training, of course, massive industry that's grown up around supporting our own teachers in the UK and teachers internationally. Um, the education technology as well. So all of these things, this is what the UK ELT sector likes. And it's a big, big sector in the UK. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So it's a sector that's evolving. Um, it's always had a strong online element to it, uh, particularly whether it's training, testing students, whether it's training and testing teachers, 
all around the world. But this is something, of course, that over the past couple of years, um, schools, institutions have moved more into, and it's, it's shaping the offer of the future for the ELT sector. Is There's different model, models, as you know, of, of online delivery, whether it's purely online, whether it's blended, hybrid, so you've got a live class, but you've also got students jo joining remotely. All of these things are now being utilised by schools, making it a prime feature of the offer going forward. They're fully open. All the schools are open in the UK. We're gradually welcoming students back. The, the, the sector's getting started again. Very difficult time. But it, of course, this safety and security and safeguarding of students in the UK, that's always been a priority. And that's, again, a strength when you're looking at encouraging students to come back and giving the students the confidence to come back to the UK after this uh, global pandemic that we've all been through. And there's a big marketing campaign, which is English with confidence hashtag. So I'd encourage you all to look out for that hashtag on social media to get the latest information about the UK ELT sector. And if we could just move uh, to the next slide, please. So this is the key. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about partnerships with Indonesia, when we're talking about the uh, Digital Innovation Fund that the British Council announced yesterday. We're looking at innovation. We're looking at ways of working together. And the UK ELT sector has always been very resilient and very, very innovative in terms of what we're doing, how we're doing it and how we're approaching challenges, whether those challenges are uh, teaching in remote areas, uh, whether those challenges are um, mm. delivering um, blended classes uh, with different types of students and differentiating the sort of work that we're doing, whether, it, whether it's fully online classes, whatever it might be, using mobile technology, using technology such as radio and all of these things to, to help students and make English accessible. English isn't something that the, that the UK owns. This is a global language. And we just happen to be extremely good and have the right experience and the right expertise to teach and to help others to teach it. It's, it's the teachers that you've got in Indonesia are doing an absolutely fantastic job. And you can look to us for support in whatever areas that you might need. And the final slide, please. Enjoy today. As I say, you've got some absolutely fantastic speakers. It's going to be a really um worthwhile event for you to be joining today we've just learned a bit about the context in indonesia which i found really interesting i'd love to learn more about that but i encourage you to to ask questions follow up with these speakers with these institutions as well that are in the catalog learn more about what's going on if you're looking for partners in the uk for your institution there's a, a couple of qr codes you can get your phone out scan those in and you can find me on on linkedin or whatever it might be and i'll help you to do that and to find partners in the uk so have a fantastic day lovely to present to you and i'll hand you back to francis thank you very much thank you very much mark uh, perfect timing ladies and gentlemen ibuichi and mark hannaberg has have set the scene of how the teachers professional development is being done in Indonesia and in the UK. And now we're going to go to the panel of a selection of leading ELT companies that will share their experience in remote teacher uh, professional development, adapting both the high and low tech tools and approaches. So please welcome the first speaker. We have Silvana Richardson. Silvana is the head of education of Bell, one of the leading language schools in the UK. Silvana, over to you. Thank you very much and good morning everybody. I'll be talking about digital innovations in particularly in online professional development for English language teachers. Um, this is good morning from me from the beautiful city of Cambridge where our headquarters is located and uh, I am the head of education and I'm based in this amazing and magnificent schools that Indonesian state school teachers visited um, a few years ago when we supported their learning, uh, helping them to develop their language expertise and then uh, to complete their um, CELTA course of teacher training. Um, 
what is Bell and who is Bell? Well, we have 65 years of teaching expertise and of expertise in uh, helping teachers become even better in terms of their expertise. And we have been at the forefront of online English language teacher education. We have been among the, peer, the pioneers in, in, in the sector in English language teaching in um, developing, designing and implementing online courses. So we've been um, uh, offering online provision for teachers for over 12 years now. And our provision, uh, which I think a few organizations can say this, has uh, uh, been nominated and won prestigious industry awards for their innovation. I think another important feature of our designs is that they're evidence informed. We look very carefully at what research has to say about what works in promoting effective and impactful teacher learning. So this morning, I wanted to talk to you about three innovative designs. Um, one is what we called micro courses. Another one is an online follow-up course that we did uh, following a blended learning course. And a third one is um, our online course uh, for remote and rural areas. So uh, a lot to say in a very little time. So let's, let's uh, hit the ground running, micro courses. So why have we designed a short micro courses? Well, we know that teachers are extremely busy. And of course, this impacts on the time that they have for professional development. In fact, a 2018 survey reported from um, teachers in 100 and over 150 countries reported that 46 of the participants in that survey believe that they did not have or spend sufficient time on their continuing professional development. So this is a real, real problem. So um, the micro courses that we have designed work around teachers' busy lives. So uh, what we uh, achieved was a compact, just-in-time design. In other words, bite-sized content that enabled teachers to learn exactly what it is that they need to learn, avoiding that kind of information overload that a lot of the time lots of courses for teachers have. But more importantly, you know, there are teachers who go from one school to the next and travel on the bus and on the train, and they take advantage of those 20 minutes they have or half an hour they have on the bus um, to learn on their mobile phone. So these courses allow them to access uh, the materials anytime, anywhere, and learn at a time and pace that suits their busy lives. So let me show you very briefly how we have designed these courses. So they're in three units. Unit one is asynchronous offline input. Unit two is an hour of a synchronous live webinar. And unit three is an asynchronous, again, offline application task. Let me uh, show you a little bit more detail. So if you like, this is an online sandwich. So we've got online, live, online. <clears throat> So, well, live online, it's all online actually. So unit one, um, basically it's all about um, participants getting to know one another, completing interactive online tasks and activities to help them process the new information. But more importantly, they're tutor led. A lot of online learning is not um, you know, tutor led at all. There's a lot of um, do this activity and get automated feedback. We don't want that. We want to, uh, our participants to have the support and the human interaction with a tutor who's experienced and expert, um, you know, guiding and, and supporting them along the way. Um, the second unit, as I said, is an opportunity for a live webinar for participants to interact and learn with tutors and other participants. And unit three is an application task. This is an opportunity, a very practical opportunity for participants to uh, apply what they have learned in the previous units. Um, and this is such an important feature of impactful teacher education. A lot of teacher education courses teach teachers stuff and they end there. All the research tells us that what matters is to um, support teachers through the difficulties of implementation. And I hope the following example um, shows this. So this is a course that we have designed and it was commissioned by the Ministry of Education in Chile. It was a train the trainer program and a blended program. So <clears throat> participants spent four weeks working face to face in the UK. And then we supported them through a three month online follow up when they went back to Chile. The important thing was that participants were from state schools all over Chile. So they were, were, they were in cities, but they were also working in remote areas. Um, and the important thing was to make sure that we created a community um, that 
kept going when they went back and they, you know, they went back to their own settings. And this online follow-up provided the peer support and the tutor support through the difficulties of implementing what they have learned. We held their hands, we allowed them to interact and we provided more ideas, more guidance and more feedback. So what was the impact of this um, follow up at the well of the whole course actually uh, the, we evaluated uh, relevant situated language skills so not any general english evaluation but it was about how do, did they use english in the specific context of their work and have a look here i'm not going to read this have a look here at how uh, they made progress from the beginning of the course till the end of the course um, but more importantly the tutors visited the participants in their own settings three months after the course finished and observed okay. how the, the participants uh, how the participants uh, transferred uh, what they had learned to their practice and the impact it had okay. on the, the learning uh, of their learners. <clears throat> More importantly as well, they give participants feedback on the progress that they've made and the opportunities for further development that they could. And they reported, of course, to the Ministry of Education. Um, this is an example, that there is no time, but just to show you how we assessed their progress, uh, not just in methodology, but also in language. These are very specific skills and that they were totally relevant to the work that they were doing. Um, and my final example, online courses for remote and rural areas. This is um, a project that we finished at the uh, big first quarter of this year, um, which what we call the prelim project, the partnered remote language improvement uh, project. And we were partnered with uh, an association in Brazil, Brass Tiesel, and a specific special interest group there. And the aim of this online program that we designed together with um, this teaching association was to increase participants' confidence in English for teaching. A lot of these teachers were teaching through uh, Portuguese and they were trying to teach English and they had very little confidence in their ability uh, to teach in English. Um, and the participants were from um, state schools all over Brazil, working in, sometimes in very low resource, rural and remote areas, including the Amazon. Um, there were teaching very large classes and very long hours and of course internet connectivity was very patchy especially in rural areas so how did we respond so we worked with our partner association together and we designed a, a, a course for low resource settings i hope this graph shows you um, what i mean by this when you've got low and patchy internet connectivity, you cannot uh, afford to include long live webinars like we're doing right now. Um, but um, we wanted to include an element of recorded video, um, you know, uh, with tutors demonstrating um, particular um, skills, but this needed to be short. And that's exactly what we did. Alongside that, uh, we made sure that the design maximized time for participants to work in self-study worksheets that they were able to download with a little, little and limited connectivity that they had and work in their own time and at their own pace. But we also knew that these teachers used social media a lot and that they access social media through their cell phones. So <clears throat> the, the medium of uh, you know, interaction, socialization and participation and learning was through chat on Telegram, which is similar to WhatsApp, but the medium of choice, and also through Facebook. Um, we, uh, I, I am told that the British Council will uh, publish its impact report in the near future, but this is um, um, an, a quote, if you like, on the personal impact that this course had on one participant. I let you read it in silence. So I hope that gives, gives you a sense of how we design and innovate and um, take into account the evidence base as we develop our courses. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, Silvana, for sharing uh, about what you've been doing with uh, your school. And now we can move to our next speaker, Mike O'Reilly. Mike is the Deputy Director of uh, Nile. Norwich Institute for Language Education. Mike, 10 minutes to you. 
Hi, hi everybody. Yes, my name's uh, Mike. It's a, a great honour uh, to be speaking to you today. I am very excited um, to talk to you about uh, Norwich Institute for Language Education, uh, Nile, and I, we could speak all day about the lessons we've learned over the last uh, 19 months, uh, but I've only got 10 minutes, so I'll do my best um, to be quick. So first I'll tell you a little bit about who we are. So we are teacher training uh, specialists. We have a long track record. We were founded um, 26 years ago. I was obviously still a baby. And although we take great pride in the face-to-face -face courses that we run here in Norwich and in our partner schools in, in Malta and in Galway, um, since uh, March uh, last year, uh, as for everybody, we've been doing everything online. Um, now, it wasn't a total shock uh, to the system for us as we've been offering um, online courses uh, since 2014. So that helped us to move courses that we plan to deliver face to face um, to deliver them online. But the landscape was uh, very different. And so um, we were faced with some interesting questions. Um, thinking about moving things online, can it be more than just an emergency temporary replacement for face-to-face -face courses? Um, how are we going to provide training in places where infrastructure is a challenge? And is there a way of scaling this up and doing it on a large sort of national um, scale? Um, and well, before I talk about those questions, I should just very quickly say that, you know, all of the success that we've managed to have is, is based on um, our great people. We work with a network of um, renowned teacher educators based all around the globe who are very willing to work um, online and their broad range of expertise has allowed us to offer everything from sort of initial um, teach training to our own uh, master's course as well. And we've also benefited from working with uh, the, uh, other great people within the community of a particular benefit for us has been uh, our association with Aqueduto, which is the Association for Quality Education and Training Online, uh, which evaluates online teach training courses. So we've had, uh, we've learned lots um, from using that um, framework. And I think that's um, uh, something we would recommend. And also, um, the other people who are invaluable to our success are our local partners. We've been lucky enough to work on projects in, um, in many countries around the world. Uh, the advantage, I think, of doing training online is that it allows us to reach many more places that we perhaps couldn't do face-to-face uh, -face training in. And we've learned um, lots from all of the people that we've been working with. But let's get back to those questions. So the first question was whether um, online courses are just emergency temporary replacements for face-to-face -face courses. Uh, I've got an example here of a course um, that's designed for pre-service um, trainee teachers from Switzerland. And usually every year they come to Norwich, they have face-to-face -face courses on, on language, on methodology, and they have a chance to look at the UK education system. We had to move that um, online. Um, and in fact, that gave us the opportunity to be innovative uh, and to make the most of that synchronous, asynchronous uh, blend of uh, online uh, training. So we had live Zoom sessions with the trainees on language development, on using drama in the classroom. And that kind of replicates what we would do here um, face to face but also using our asynchronous platform, they were able to watch uh, video recordings from UK primary classrooms or secondary classrooms. And in, they could do that in their own time without all of the complicated arrangements uh, being made with the local schools here. They could also work individually asynchronous, asynchronously, uh, working on their own uh, language development. And they could also collaborate asynchronously using lots of the tools that the internet offers, such as uh, Padlets and Google Docs. And they even had a chance to have a live Q&A with a UK um, head teacher via uh, Zoom. Um, the second question 
um, that we had was what about delivering training in places where uh, resources and infrastructure can be a challenge. Uh, and we've learned that it can still be effective in those areas as well. We had the pleasure of uh, working on a great project with the British Council, uh, working with 24 teacher trainers from across Sub-Saharan Africa as part of the English Connects Trainer Award. And they came from 12 countries where um, connectivity and uh, access to data can be uh, a challenge, uh, but it wasn't insurmountable. The, the, the suggestion from our partners was that we actually ran the first week of the course intensively and the trainees were uh, put in venues, local venues that had stable um, internet connections and they attended the live uh, Zoom sessions in meeting rooms there. And crucially, we created a WhatsApp group so that uh, we could stay in touch with the participants and share documents if they lost uh, their internet um, connection. Um, and helpfully, our local partners also provided uh, data packages for the teachers um, involved. Um, and the, the great advantage of that WhatsApp group is it's still going on and that it's now become uh, kind of a community of practice. So with a bit of creativity and a bit of good planning, those resource restrictions can be um, overcome. And our third question about moving everything online was whether we could scale things up and implement things uh, on a national scale. And we learned one way of doing this through our biggest project last year, um, which was the training of 5,000 um, primary school teachers from Tunisia. Um, we learned two key lessons there. Firstly, the importance of local partners and secondly, flexibility. It was a huge project with kind of more than 20 uh, Zoom sessions happening at the same time, four times uh, a day. And every week we had new teachers. Uh, our partners, the, the local Ministry of Education, the British Council, were crucial. Um, they preloaded um, tablets and uh, every weekend they would distribute them from one group of teachers to the next. And they also set up support via a Facebook uh, group um, and with hundreds of primary teachers every week that was a, a, a really useful um, channel of communication and we had a WhatsApp group um, for them as well. Another really interesting part of the project was we worked with local um, teacher, senior teachers who helped our um, trainers deliver the sessions. So it was really useful to have them there. They could solve problems in the local language if needed, but it was also a great developmental opportunity um, for them um, as well. The other thing, the other lesson we learned in this big project was you have to be flexible. I remember at the start of one week, about five minutes before the first lesson, uh, there was a, a global Zoom crash everything went down but we managed uh, we just changed the timetable that day my hair went gray uh, at that moment but um yes you do need the the willingness and the ability to think um, on your feet um we're not new to online training one thing we've learned by offering our courses over the last seven years this um as sylvana mentioned in her talk it's really um, important to uh, engage with the research and reflect on what is effective. Um, we've also found it useful to innovate, so we're offering new courses. This is our latest course with uh, Russell Stannard. We're offering courses for teachers um, who teach through English, so EMI and CLIL. And uh, we're also looking at expanding through, we're part of INTO, um, this is a picture of uh, a, a regional centre in Vietnam, and we will soon be offering face-to-face -face courses um, there as well. And we've also got uh, a new partnership with Digital Learning Associates. So if you're a, a teacher and attending this, we've got some great videos you can use in the classroom just by um, going to our um, membership area and you can download the lesson plans for those. So um, I said I would be quick, so I think my 10 minutes is up. The lessons we've learned, crucially, innovate, be flexible, 
take advantage of everything that online has to offer and work with great partners. Thank you for your time. And I hope that uh, I'll get to work with many of you as well. Thank you, Mike. Um, I can see in the chat box, people are commenting. Uh, they are inspired by what uh, have been presented so far. And I would like to um, ask uh, participants to uh, stay for the panel discussion after this with all the panelists. We're going to the next speaker now. Um, we have Charlotte Thompson. She's the Director of, of Training of International House London. Charlotte, you also have 10 minutes. Time is yours. Okay, thank you very much. I've shared my screen with you. Can you see it? Yes. Lovely, marvellous. Okay, so um, hi everyone. The 10 minute clock is counting down. I'm literally putting the timer on. <laughs> um, so I would like to talk to you a little bit today about some projects that we've been involved with recently um, and share some things that we have learned. Just as Mike said, we have learned so much um, over the last uh, 18 months um, from working in lockdown, but also um, from working globally with our partners um, in recent years. Okay. So I'm uh, the Director of Training from International House London and uh, IH London is a charitable trust uh, founded in the 1950s um, and our um, long-term sort of belief has been the idea of promoting international understanding through language education. So whether that's being a teacher or learning a language, um, in that experience, you learn so much about different people in different cultures. Okay. So one of the first uh, projects I'd like to talk to you about um, is a British Council uh, initiative. And we were working in West Africa um, in uh, teacher development and teacher trainer development. And I call this a high and low tech project. Uh, the British Council is partnering with uh, ministries of education and uh, teacher associations. And the teacher associations were really important to make things happen on the ground. We were involved with this project for three years and um, it started face to face with uh, teachers coming to London and then it continued in country um, with teacher trainers. And the uh, longer term objective of the project is we were supporting the teacher trainers in each country to devise and implement their own um, plans for CPD for the teachers that they were supervising and responsible for. So the teacher training, the trainer training that we were doing with these groups, they really wanted the live experience um, of uh, to replicate what we'd been able to do sort of face to face previously. So we opted for Zoom training. Um, and our Zoom training um, was absolutely backed up with WhatsApp and it became a very hybrid model. So in this kind of training session now, you're all logged on to your own personal um, devices from home. That happened in some countries. But in other places, the teachers were maybe able to gather in a local school or the Ministry of Education. So the group that we're working with are together. So as we run the training program and we're delivering live sessions like this, they have the opportunity to sit together, to work together, to share ideas and do exactly what you could do in a classroom with people. Um, in other countries, it was completely 100% online. Some places we had a mix of those two models going on. So we called that a hybrid uh, training uh, delivery mode. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, exactly as uh, I said earlier, what happens halfway through your live Zoom sessions is sometimes the whole thing stops. So we were absolutely using our mobile phones. And through our setup groups, we could flip our training immediately into live action on WhatsApp. Now, we really never thought that you could do so much in WhatsApp. And we were so surprised at what we were able to do with these teachers um, through keeping the communication going um, in, that, in that way. Okay, So big, big part 
of the low tech aspect of this training was really that mentoring of the teacher trainers on WhatsApp. Um, and our teacher communicate, uh, community of practice also that were set up on WhatsApp. So we trained the trainers and the trainers trained their teachers with the CPD that they devised in each of these countries. So what works in WhatsApp? Well, everything. Um, the community of practice groups were really interesting. Um, we first of all thought that little groups would be very um, supportive and very welcoming for teachers, and they would feel free and happy to share their ideas in a sort of protected environment. And that's true. But after a while, what happened is that sometimes those groups petered out. So we found that larger groups being managed by two or three mentors were much more sustainable and much more engaging. Each um, WhatsApp group had its own uh, rules and monitors and they moderated that themselves. Okay. We found very effective using kind of a very regular cycle of um, posting. Say for example, on Saturday you post your content, on Wednesday you do a follow-up, on Thursday, by Thursday, everyone has commented on, on that topic. And then by Saturday, you start your topic again. So we practice with lots of different things. And we found that um, we could run and try and maintain the focus on pedagogic topics um, just um, in using that one single stream of WhatsApp um, if we had some regular sort of rules and, and procedures. What was also very successful was for the um, trainers to share little clips from the classroom. So whenever they could share something that they were doing, some kind of success story, then that really, really kept the focus of the community of practice going um, in these groups. And for each group in each different country, they set their own agenda for how to measure the success of their WhatsApp group. And it really, really depends on what they were trying to achieve, what their focus was with that group. So it could be engagement of teachers or certain pedagogic principles that they were trying to communicate. And it could also be on how much the teachers valued that community that they were part of. So that's the, that's the sort of low tech end of the training we've been doing recently. A little bit more high tech, maybe is um, a project that's ongoing at the moment in Vietnam. Um, this is a partnership project um, and the partnership projects are fantastic. We're working with um, university in Vietnam, HPU2, and the value of that uh, for us as a partner is our partners know the country, they know the challenges, they know the teachers. So we're learning so much together and co-creating the project as we go along. And our objective in Vietnam was to um, engage teachers from remote areas. So remote area doesn't mean no internet in Vietnam. They've actually got very stable internet, either at home or in their local school. So they're able to follow a live, uh, a live and asynchronous project as well online. So the context in Vietnam is new course books, lots of great material. Um, and the challenge for the teachers is how to adapt this great new material and the curriculum for their own students. So we're looking at differentiated learning in the classroom and teaching online. So our findings with these teachers. So they absolutely can follow in a week, maybe two hours of a live synchronous training session um, that's participatory fairly participatory. If the teachers miss that, we can also then share after um, a, a much pared down version that can be shared on um, Google Classroom for them to watch later. So they've got two different sort of modes of input. Then the teachers are using Padlet because it's a lovely visual representation for their materials. And they're also very active in Zalo. And Zalo is just like WhatsApp. Okay. So we've got multiple different um, uh, platforms and apps being used. And the teachers are developing their digital skills alongside experiencing online sort of teaching and learning. 
And this has really created a, a community. It's just 60 teachers. It's a relatively small number of teachers. But what we found in Vietnam is a very, very high level of participation and collaboration because the kind of enthusiasm that the teachers have and the looking for digital solutions um, that's taking place now in, in that country has meant that the teachers have absolutely leapt in um, to this project. We were a little bit nervous or whether they would be willing to share their ideas so quickly but we were really, really uh, happy to see how quickly they, they did actually embrace digital online learning. And the high level of participation as well, we think, is because this project is asking the teachers to be creative. And we're asking them to uh, attend a session and then create something that they can use in their very next lessons. So they were preparing for a September start and they have created things, shared them, critiqued them, um, and learned from each other. And now September's come and they're in their classes and experimenting with them. So we'll be following on with this group of teachers to see how it works, to get feedback. And then later in the year, we'll be sharing what they've learned with other colleagues and other peers. So there are two projects that we've been part of, and I hope sharing what um, we've learned and what, what works in these two different contexts, the high tech and the much lower tech, um, is useful to people when they're planning their projects and what they're going to do in India now, Indonesia now as part of this digital innovation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. It's been interesting that you can also share the low tech part of um, this, this uh, training and program that you have been doing. Now we're going to go to um, Viona Dunlop, the principal at Wimbledon School of English, and she will share what she's been doing uh, in terms of teachers' professional development there. Viona, you have 10 minutes. Hi everyone, um, and lovely to be here. Um, welcome to everyone joining in, in Indonesia. So I'm Fiona, I'm the principal at Wimbledon School of English in London. Uh, this is our school, if I can just try and move my slides on, here we are. This is Wimbledon School of English. It's one of the oldest independent schools in the UK. I've been there for 20 years, so I'm still a baby there. Um, and we've got a really strong core of uh, excellent permanent teachers and trainers there. Uh, we're named as the joint number one school in the UK, according to British Council inspection reports. So um, quality is high and we've been doing teacher training there ever since I can remember. Uh, these are uh, some of the courses that we, we currently offer and we have been offering for several years. Um, if I can just, excuse me, if I can just go back, I want, want to just focus on these courses here for a second. Um, a lot of our courses are bespoke, so we are working, as the others also talked about, on very needs-driven courses, taking into account all of the participants and really individualising the experience. But what I would like to do, like um, the others before me, is outline uh, one particular case study that we've had. The past 18 months for everyone has been very, very challenging, but um, we've learned a lot from it. And um, we, we've been teaching online and delivering training online for three to four years now. So when the pandemic came, it wasn't such a difficult shift to move everything online temporarily. And um, I'm happy to say that we're currently uh, working face-to-face -face in school and online and hybrid. Uh, so um, lots of different opportunities for us all in the school. But to outline one particular case study that we've dealt with in the last 18 months, uh, we were lucky enough to be involved in the prelim project, a uh, project with British Council, IATEFL and English UK. And we were working with Vietnam and we were working remotely. And um, the, the, the course ran, excuse me, from uh, November 2020 to March 2021, um, when we were working with primary and secondary teachers um, who taught a range of subjects. And we found, again, nothing surprising. 
has really worked and um, we had excellent feedback from both uh, aspects of the course. So the course was two hours of synchronous study, one evening per week for six weeks in groups of between 12 to 17 participants. And I know that's quite a particular detail, but um, what we found was we, we, we started thinking that we could do a lot and we wanted to offer a lot of synchronous uh, provision, but we found that less is more. And it was important to really fit the timing in along with the busy teacher that um, Silvana mentioned. And uh, hand in hand, we had two to five hours of asynchronous study, which was looking at very individualized blended projects with the guidance and feedback from the, the trainer. The content in this particular project was English language skills um, integrated with soft skills that we're, we all know and more, and um, also teacher methodology running through all of the, the course. Three different levels as well. So starting from A2, going up to C2 and the platforms there. And here we are, here's um, a photo of our leaving ceremony and um, with some of our lovely, lovely participants. It really, I mean, to be honest, and I'm sure everyone will agree that the feedback and the feel good factor that we all had in working in partnership and um, with the particular teachers in Vietnam was amazing. Um, so our approach and benefits at WSE, um, we talk with the trainees, so it's about them, the trainee is at the heart. It's all about communicating pre-course, making sure the information is clear and really listening to their needs and what they don't need. Um, the course content is by negotiations. It's being led by the trainees. Uh, we've got experience and training all types of teacher, um, unqualified, newly qualified and experienced. And that, that relationship with our trainees, with our experienced teachers, it lasts longer than the course in, in all respects. Uh, language and skills acquisition is not simply about learning facts. It's about building confidence and providing ongoing structured support for trainers uh, when tra trainees when they've been with us. We provide the tools to continue to develop autonomously. Um, and I think, again, that is key that um, anyone who's studying at any point in their lives, and you know, I personally am very passionate about my own professional development, I must have the tools um, to be able to develop autonomously rather than only following a course and then stopping. And sorry, my slides keep moving. We, we provide so, okay. So our aim is for all of the trainees to complete a course feeling that their needs have been met and that they're confident. And um, again, this goes without saying, they should be more able to perform effectively in the classroom while providing an ongoing professional development plan. So leaving them with something to work with um, lifelong in the development rather than just the, the longevity of the course. And I think very importantly, professional development must be inclusive and available to all, uh, regardless of remoteness, uh, time, money. I think it must be able to be developed and offered in such a way that it's including every single teacher. And so the lessons that we learned from our Vietnamese project uh, was, as I said, less is more, um, not to try and fill in too much. So one evening per week of face-to-face -face that was really targeted, really structured and led by the trainees. Um, clear aims established from the start of the project so that everybody has their expectations managed um, and we know where we're aiming to get to. Ongoing testing, structured needs analysis to really make sure that there is no time wasted in content that is not needed for each particular individual and each particular group. Sustainability and um, trickle down training so that the courses, the, the sessions, the workshops, the materials, the worksheets can all be used autonomously and shared um, in a structured way across the organization. We learned that connectivity should not be taken for granted uh, in remote areas and um, obviously looking at the platforms that are used. 
Uh, feedback systems as well, very, very important. How do we provide feedback? When do we provide feedback and to who as well? Um, a little thing that we just thought was the icing on the cake, and again, I'm sure this is common in most organisations, but we had the most delightful leaving ceremony and where we prevent, uh, provided end of course certificates. And this really was a time for celebration um, in the middle of a pandemic uh, to get everyone together to have a, a, a nice formal leaving ceremony online. Uh, and then to provide a, a, a funnel for follow-up sessions, individualized and focused with the participants. So these were the lessons that we learned from our Vietnamese project We've had a lot more than just this in terms of working online. And um, I, th I really do believe, as Mike said, that this is the future, that these things are here to stay. And I think English language organisations and the British Council, this is our, our strength. We do this so well. And um, certainly at Wimbledon School of English, professional development for all runs through every single thing that we do. Uh, we... We were also working in the region. We worked in Laos uh, previously, three or four years ago. We had our school in partnership in Laos, uh, running, teaching kids, so not teacher training. And we also found that working remotely and managing uh, a school and a team of staff was also a real learning experience and really rewarding for us. So there's more to managing projects than just the delivery. It's all the back end stuff as well that must be very strongly in place. So with that in mind, what our students say is the most important. And I just thought this, this quote was lovely. So the course benefits me so much. The virtual class is so well managed by experienced teachers, despite the intervention of COVID-19 and the far, far connection among us. I learned much more from the most useful and tactful skill from my beloved teacher. Um, lovely, lovely personal comments. And we, we had a, a bank of these that were, really made it such a rewarding experience. And from this, just to sum up very briefly, some of the opportunities that we thought might be transferable into the Indonesian context would be various teaching with technology offerings. Uh, so looking at hybrid, how to teach hybrid, how to teach remotely how to teach online and really polishing up the skills that we've all learned during the pandemic. Of course, more emphasis in the, in the world, the, the, the growth of CLIL and EME, um, moving on training the trainer and giving the tools back to the teachers to lead that and feed, feed that into the communities of practice that exist and setting up the communities of practice in other areas for teachers, giving them the tools to, to work and develop together uh, without the presence of the, the core organization. English language top up courses were found are really fundamental uh, across the world. And um, there's always a place for this. And also fully asynchronous courses to run alongside synchronous courses or subscribe to in isolation. So these are just some of the opportunities that we think are there and we think could be offered by the UK market and also particularly uh, at Wimbledon School of English. So I believe that's me within my time. Thank you all for listening. My email is at the bottom of the slides there and um, looking forward to the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Perfect timing. Ladies and gentlemen, we have heard um, the sharing of what um, ELT providers in the UK have been doing in terms of teachers' professional development. Now we come to the last speaker of the session, and it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Gumawang Jati. But Jati is the president of ITAL, and he's also the lecturer, a lecturer at Bandung Institute of Technology. Uh, but Jati, since you are a single fighter to present uh, the Indonesian uh, situation of teacher professional uh, development. I give you 15 minutes, Padjati. Over to you. Okay, uh, thank you, Francis. Hi, everyone. Um, after listening to uh, UK providers, that is my time now to share. 
uh, the TPT, what's happened in Indonesia. So I'm going to concentrate uh, on the innovation and teacher professional development in Indonesia only. I'm going to mention some companies later on and also the government. And I'm going to introduce as well what uh, ITEL has been doing up to this moment. Yeah. Okay. Now, this is a PTPD that's uh, yesterday uh, mentioned by Pak Iwan from the Ministry of uh, Education. Starting from 2010 up to the present, they moved from face-to-face uh, -face into a planet and online. And it's top-down and it can reach uh, remote areas. So they got uh, uh, all of the uh, effort then to put that in online. Now everything is uh, online because of the pandemic. There's a guru belajar and berbagi kemerdekaan.co.id. So if you click here, then they will be uh, taken to a website where the teacher can learn from each other, and also the teacher can share a lot of uh, a lot of things. Um, and it's quite popular. But again, the TPT here it's not for language only, but it's a TPT in general for every subject. Yeah. So if we go to the website then um, you'll go to uh, teacher section and you can click learn or you can click share if you have something to share you click share so this is from teacher to teacher i think it's a it's a it's a good movement um what's happening right now for tpd in indonesia so the innovation side it's blended tpd now it's become online fully self-study tpd and from teachers also to teachers yeah so if you are teachers in indonesia you can have a look at that and if you have a lot of ideas you can share that for the uk participants uh, this is what's happening uh, right now yeah other than that because uh, we are a big country of course then we need a community and also private sectors uh, involving in tpd uh, i'm going to mention two so far that's quite big and influential in indonesia it's called guru chika this is a tpd for teachers Again, it's all subject, not necessarily English. It's a learning teachers community, and it's happening in Jawa Island mostly. Yeah, so they're using uh, a lot of technology and social media to reach the uh, the teachers. Yeah, and it's open for donation. It's open for uh, professional or companies to join this movement, and then they will create a TPD for for teachers and that yeah so if you click here that will uh, give you information um, on how to join and how to participate in um, this movement yeah uh, this in bahasa indonesia this is a teacher community and then for tpt uh, for a quality of delivery then also provide a pss to learn yeah scholarships for teachers yeah that's what happened um, the movement another movement um, that's uh, i know and i'm aware of um, i give a speech sometime in this movement as well it's hafex uh, hafex is a tpt for teachers again it's for all subject for all level um, it's, it's uh, started with in-house training and it's happening in kalimantan it's in borneo now they have an office in Jakarta and also Yogyakarta. So they started with in-house training and class training. Then they move uh, online. Yeah, they have the platform. The platform, they planning to have a platform for lecturers. So if you are lecturers, you can study there and also students and teachers. But the platform for teachers and students are uh, still under construction. So if you click the the teachers here then the teacher can register and they can learn online and the subject is there and some of the courses here are free if you're math teachers or whatever if you're an english teacher uh, maybe you will find some of these uh, courses useful for you yeah have a look at that some are free some are very cheap if you look at this is a 32 uh, hours meeting hours that's only 15 uh, so it's around maybe one or two pounds pounds so it's very cheap everything is online yeah so that's the um, the moment yeah so the trend of innovation is everything is going online there is a platform um try to uh, involve teachers in developing their own need and sharing
Okay, now let's uh, move on to the MKMP. Ibu Ije mentioned about the uh, Musyawarah Guru Mata Pelajaran. There's a forum for teachers, by teachers. It's a mandatory. It's facilitated them to improve the teaching practice. It's not, uh, it's in every subject. So the innovation here is uh, they can create their own program. So it's not top down. It's uh, from the bottom. And then they can share a lot of things among them. They can invite experts that they can uh, organize seminars and they organize a lot of webinars. That's what I'm aware of. Yeah. So there are a lot of MKMP for English teachers in Indonesia. It must be, must be a thousand of MKMP. Yeah. I tell us uh, help MKMP as well, uh, keeping training on that. Yeah. Okay. So this MKMP is a, it's a movement that uh, empower the TPD uh, crown to earth. Yeah. And they need this group. Actually, they need a lot of uh, help and uh, consultation and so on. Okay. Let's move on to ITEL. Um, ITEL is Indonesia Technology Enhanced Language Learning Association. So it's uh, concentrating on language learning. Only English? No. Every language. So we have uh, mostly still at the moment is that English. Um, this, is, this association is uh, the board member, a group of uh, language lecturers, and they are all technology enthusiasts. Because this is association, so it's a non-profit organization and we have to have a partner to run our business and to run training and so on um, this is uh, our dream to become an effective professional association in developing technology based language learning so it's uh, all about technology and language learning um, this is what we did before the pandemic uh, we did a lot of uh, trainings uh, low tech high tech uh, we have been invited by a lot of MKMP. Uh, we work with the British Council a lot, uh, giving training from rural area to in uh, big cities. And we also um, invited by education foundations to run trainings for them. So we are a group of uh, people and stressing on how to use technology in learning language. So if you look at here in, in, in Borneo, for instance, there is no internet connection. Of course, that they got laptop, then uh, we embed some program so that they can use it in the classroom. Yeah. And um, the beginning of the pandemic, we were in Bali, Julie, with the British Council, and that was uh, memorable. Uh, we all, almost uh, have to stay there. That was the first day or the last flight that we have to catch to go back home actually from the island. This is the photo taken there. We are still happy, but we are a little bit nervous because uh, when we got into the room, then we ha they have to check our temperature and we did not know what's, uh, what's the virus like and, and so on and so on. So it's a bit panicking. And then we write that after the training, we flew back to uh, Bandung in Jakarta and that was okay. Okay, anyway. So um, that was face to face, and we got a lot of uh, track records on that. Uh, during the pandemic, we moved that on uh, online. Like we run a workshop. Here is a run workshop, a TPT for uh, Indonesia Air Force English teachers. Yeah, uh, we run this uh, together with the British Council. Yeah. Um, that's a TPT for uh, teachers. Now we also, we Speaking with students, so we training pre-service teachers, like from uh, Universitas Ibnu Khaldun, that's in Bogor. We run the TPD for pre-service teachers face to face. It's been running for four years. Then we moved that online during the pandemic. Then we have a Universitas Jember, for instance, that's a uh, teachers to be English teachers to be. Then um, we have a Lambung Mangkurat and also Muhammadiyah in Jakarta uh, online. So after. Uh, the pandemic happened, then we move everything online like uh, other people because it's not allowed to run a training face to face. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's what we did actually on teacher and pre service teachers. Now, um, webinar. We run a lot of webinar just right after the first uh, COVID breakout. Uh, we ran our first seminar, uh, webinar, it was in the 13th of April. 
because of the demand and we are aware that the teachers need a lot of help. Everything is suddenly, you are not allowed to go to school, everything should be online and so on. So it's a lot of confusion happened and people are waiting for the regulation and there was a little bit late of the regulation and so on, uh, direction and so on. So uh, we got the initiative uh, to run a webinar and then um, I talked to Pak Kon from the British Council, how we do it together and so on. So we ran uh, 12 webinars in a week. So it's almost every day we run that. It based on what the teachers need. So it's very practical so that they can survive in, in front of the class. If you need the recording, it's still there. Yeah, and it's uh, reaching up to a thousand participants in that webinar. Yeah. Um, the demand was very high, and the teachers need more. And contact us, us so that uh, we ran another webinar that was seven webinars starting in June until the 8th. So it's again, it's a marathon webinar with uh, some speakers from British and also from mostly from Aida. Yeah. Like the first webinar series, there are four uh, British Council speakers. Uh, I think it's Colm and um, Joe Dale from the UK. Yeah. And other workshop for schools, we also run that. Yeah. Because everything should be online. After that, then we run a workshop with the British Council as well for SMK vocational schools. Uh, and we are planning to run another 10 webinar uh, starting next month, 14th of October, uh, 28th of October, so like twice a month. And we're going to run, we're planning to run around 10 uh, series. So it's going to be 10 speakers from the UK and 10 speakers from Indonesia. Yeah. Um, hopefully we can um, do that. Uh, nicely because uh, everyone is uh, familiar with online but we're going to look at more deeper uh, practice what we can learn and how we can improve that okay other than webinar and also trainings we also have a conference we started our conference in 1960 that's uh, technology enhanced language learning teaching and researching um, <clears throat> That moment, uh, somebody from UK, it's uh, Nick Pichi, came to our first webinar. That's when ITEL was established, actually. If you need the proceedings, then you can click here. Later on, you can get my slide. Um, we, I will give you the link later in the chat box, or somebody maybe can help me. Yeah. Um, 2018, the team is Call and More. It's about thinking process. And if you want the proceeding, you click here. Um, the last one, just before the pandemic breakout, uh, 2020, we ran a seminar in Bogor in Universitas Ebno uh, We start questioning, can technology really enhance language learning? So we look at uh, the real practices. We talk about that. Again, it's from teachers and uh, practitioners on that. 2022, we're going to have another face-to-face -face, uh, conference. Um, if you need uh, the registration, you can click here later on. That's uh, the team will be then, now, and future directions. Yeah. So we're going to look at AI. We're going to look at other new technology, what we, we can do for language learning. So looking forward to joining with us later. That's going to be in July. Hopefully everything is uh, okay so that we can meet and uh, discuss things there. Yeah. Uh, another thing that we did is uh, uh, we wrote uh, simple books based on our uh, experience uh, giving training teachers, not all of us, but some of us. Um, it's published in July this year. Uh, it's been downloaded 760. And if you need a book, then you can click here. Then you can get the book that's in the Google Play. It's free. Yeah, because we are a non-profit organization as well. So we try to do things uh, with partners and for teachers. Yeah. Um, the last one of my slide is an uh, online course. We did a pilot project with Semolek, that's a Ministry of Education in the regions. So um, we pilot a project on uh, digital comics for engaging online learning course. Um, that's a five-week course. It's not MOOC. It's a 
guided open on the post. So, uh, around 90% is uh, working on asynchronous. Then like around 10% it will be guided. Yeah. So the teachers participate in this pilot project is from Indonesia, from Malaysia, and also from Thailand. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. If you need my slide, you can go to bit.ly slash PC, stand for British Council, minus ITEL. Then you can get uh, all my slide and also the links that I provided there. Yeah. Thank you very much. Back to you too, Francis. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, Pajati. So I can see that people are sharing information as well about ITEL YouTube channel in the chat box. Ladies and gentlemen, we have heard from all the presenters today, and it's been a really informative and inspiring series of talks. However, I'm afraid we do not have time for a long panel discussion today. I would like to bring uh, our panelists, if they can um, be spotlighted, uh, start the video. Um, we won't have a long panel discussion, but there is time for one question, which I would like to ask our speakers. Um, and don't worry, later today, we will share a booklet with the contact details of all of the schools and speakers today. And I know they will be very happy to respond to any questions you might have. So, hello, speakers. Nice to yeah, see you on gallery. Hi. Hi. <laughs> okay. So there are many English teachers joining us today from across Indonesia. And so if I can ask you in one minute, what top tip would you have for teachers who want to develop their teaching skills? Mm -hmm. um, let's start from Charlotte, you're nodding. <laughs> sure. Um, I think uh, the best thing to do is find another teacher to work with um, because everybody needs a buddy, either in your school or somebody that's a friend and together um, decide one small area that you want to focus on, research it with these amazing resources that you've got or the British Council, and then both of you try something in your class, compare your results, and also ask your students what they think of this, because your students will give you great feedback on what they think of the activity you're teaching, and they will give you great feedback on how they feel about their learning. I think that's my top tip for teachers. Nice. Um teaching buddy yeah final uh, partner all right so uh, how about you mike in one minute what top tip would you give um so i think well one great habit that you can develop is that of reflection so if you're reading an article attending a webinar or an event like today just get into that habit of asking yourself what you've learned um how it can change your own practice and then actually write it down i even have a reflective book to do that oh, in wow. but the, the tool doesn't matter i think the habit is just get into that habit of, of of recording that learning and reflecting on it so yeah take time to reflect that's my my tip take time to reflect and how about you fiona yeah i, I completely agree with both both mike and charlotte i'm i'm such a big fan of reflective practice in my life and my my professional life and um, I, I would say identify a particular area uh, that you like, you'd like to develop, um, something that you're interested in, maybe based on feedback from your students, from your reflection, um, from an observation that you've done on yourself. Um, set yourself, I, I think I would go a step further and say, set yourself a realistic time-bound goal. Okay. Write it down, tell people so that you're tied to it, but break that goal down into little bite-sized chunks. And don't be hard on yourself, be kind to yourself and praise yourself at the end of every little bite. Um, if you don't get to your goal, if you don't meet your time, don't be hard on yourself, just keep going, keep praising yourself, get feedback from your students, from your peers, and then repeat. And it keeps moving you forward and it really makes you feel good. It's a real sense of achievement to get through every little step and something that you're interested in. It's not something that needs to be a, a, an area that you think you're failing in. It can be an area that you really want to grow in. Um, and also do your research. Sorry, this I love, I love professional development for also, but do your research because there's a lot of good stuff out there. And we mentioned communities of practice. If you don't have access to something like this formally, set one up. Just turn it into a, a coffee evening with some of your peers, some of your friends, but give it a focus and turn it into something that will benefit you. And British Council is a wonderful resource. 
Wonderful tips. I like that. And I like the be kind to yourself. Pak Jati, how about you? Um, I think it's um, it's good for us, uh, similar, that we have to work with our students. Listen to the students, talk to the students, and use the virtual space. Uh, talking to young people, to uh, this next generation, we use uh, that they use a lot of virtual space. So talk about games and so on, and then do reflection. By the way, uh, the students, it's our partner in learning. Yeah, I think that's uh, Francis. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm so sad that we don't really have a lot of time and I'm sure teachers would like to um, get to know more about this um, teaching, uh, teacher professional development, but Thank you so much, Pajati, Mai, Fiona, Charlotte. We're missing Silvana. She's not on the list anymore. Um, that concludes the first session of today. So thank you for your wonderful sharings. I'm sure everyone learns a lot. And it's nice to be able to get to know what each other's doing in the UK and also in the Indonesia. Before we continue to the next session, um, I would like to um, invite the attendees to just give your clap hands to thank the speakers of the first session. Thank you. People are saying clap, clap, clap. Thank you, great presenters. Okay, so now we're going to go to the second session, but we're going to have a break. We don't really have a lot of time because we're running out of uh, time for the first session, but we have a special treat for you. ITEL has a special treat for you. Last year, at the beginning of the pandemic, when teachers were suddenly forced to shift to online teaching, and there were moments when teachers, I know I did, uh, felt overwhelmed. Um, if you remember that moment, now during that moment, one of ITAL board members collaborated in a song dedicated to teachers. And I think it goes along with what Fiona uh, said earlier, be kind to yourself you cannot, if you cannot meet your goal. This song is for teachers. When you cannot do what you do, then you do what you can. So ladies and gentlemen, to start your five minutes breaks, please welcome To Arso Makul and John Bon Jovi. They shut down the borders And they boarded up the school Small towns are rolling up their sidewalks One last paycheck coming through I know you're feeling kind of nervous But all a little bit confused Nothing's the same, this ain't again We gotta make it through When you can't do what you do You do what you can this ain't my prayer, it's just a thought I'm wanting to send Down here we bend but don't break Down here we all understand When you can't do what you do You do what you can Here's your verse Though the kids can go to school Learning at home is also cool Though they miss their friends so long they still play games with mom and dad They just travel with technology Can't find the right methodology Just with this one over his gun Teach you can still be fun When you can't do what you do You do what you can This ain't my prayer It's just a thought I'm wanting to send Down here we bend but don't break down here we all understand You can't do what you do You do what you can You can't do what you do You do what you can You can't do what you do You do what you can Oh, yeah Can't do what you do Just do what you Look, that was great. We wrote this song together. Remember to post your verse using hashtag do what you can.
Okay, welcome back everybody. Welcome to the second session today. I hope you managed to get your toilet breaks or get a cup of coffee or tea. We are now in the second session and we're going to be talking about English teacher professional development in higher education. Particularly, we're going to look at the capacity building for English teachers and EMI lecturers working in higher education. And we have um, four speakers today uh, who will present um, their experience and expertise. I would like to introduce the first speaker, Ibu Cecilia Halimi. Hi, Ibu. Ibu Cecilia Hi, is the manager for Corporation and Ventures, um, Faculty of Humanities, Universitas uh, Indonesia. And she will start the session. Ibu Cecilia, time is yours. Thank you, Francis. Okay, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. In the next 15 minutes, I'm going to share with you uh, some information about English language teaching in higher education in Indonesia. I'll start my presentation by quoting Dennis Wetley uh, that says, if teachers are not learning, they are not growing and not moving toward excellence. I think uh, I like this quote in relation to the, uh, uh, the, the program which is offered by the British councils for both schools and universities in Indonesia. I think the purpose of the grants offered is for us to create innovative programs uh, for teachers professional development so that we all can move toward excellence. I'll start my presentation Oh, sorry. And the purpose of this presentation is, I think, to provide to provide the UK partners with an overview of English teachers and EMI lecturers training needs in Indonesian higher education institution. Let's start by discussing the, the English teaching in higher education institution in Indonesia. Well, in Indonesia, there are two faculties that uh, focus on English as the core of subject of their students. The first one is the Faculty of Teachers Education and the second one is the Faculty of Humanities or the Faculty of Letters. The Faculty of Teachers Education prepares their students to become English language uh, teachers for all levels of education in Indonesia. While at the Faculty of Humanities, English is learned as a subject, as a tool for them to learn English literature, English linguistics, and also to do cultural studies. But in both universities, uh, they learn, in, they spend a lot of time for uh, improving their students' English proficiency. Uh, I think they spend at least four semesters with 10 to 12 learning hours per week. And in one semester, they have 16 uh, effective week, uh, week learning. And the goal of this is, I think, to improve their proficiency, uh, uh, their English proficiency. For the Faculty of Teachers Education, I think the target is to achieve the C1 level of proficiency, while at the Faculty of Humanities, the target is to achieve B2 level of proficiency. But some universities uh, or some uh, higher education institution which are good, uh, they can achieve up to C1 or C2 level of proficiency. In addition to this, in all universities, uh, there is one course which is called uh, English M, uh, well, uh, usually you call it as MKU, uh, MKU English subject, which is uh, required by the university. And it is an obligatory subject that has to be taken by all students from whatever faculty in, uh, in the university. 
and the credit for this course varies uh, between two and three credits. And in some universities, they sometimes also offer this course for two semesters. This is uh, the program offered is uh, usually general English course, but in some universities, they offer this as an English for general academic purposes. This is also true for the uh, vocational tertiary institution and also polytechnics. Uh, most of this institution also offer the subject uh, in the form of general English course. Only some of them offer the subjects as English for occupational purposes. And as, Indone as Indonesian universities attempt to strengthen their global competitiveness and to internalize their curricula, EMI, English as a medium of instruction, is now being introduced at both undergraduate and postgraduate levels in programs with international students and also in courses exclusively for Indonesian students. Uh, and this program, are gen uh, I think the teaching staff are generally enthusiastic about this EMI. Now let's talk about the lecturers at the higher education institution. I can group them into three big groups. The first one is the English lecturers. They are lecturers who teach English at the Faculty of Teacher Education and the Faculty of Humanities. And we also have the uh, um, KU English lecturers, these are lecturers who are responsible for teaching the three credit English course for all students at the university. And these lecturers are usually part-time lecturers. They are not full-time lecturers. The last group is the subject lecturers. Uh, they, they are in different faculties uh, in the universities. And they uh, now, because of the EMI programs, they have to teach their subjects in English. Let's start with the English lecturers. Well, the English lecturers at the Faculty of uh, Teacher Education and at the Faculty of Humanities, they all have a good command of English. I think because they spend a lot of their time learning English. But some of them do not have language teaching skills when they start teaching. This is especially true for those who come from the Faculty of Humanities or the Faculty of Letters. But all of them are responsible for teaching language classes. So uh, they need some training in relation to the language teaching skills. The second group is the subject uh, lecturers. Uh, they, uh, uh, they also have a good command of English because most of them graduated for uni from universities overseas. But most of them do not have any training in teaching their subjects in English. So they just go into class and then deliver their subjects in English. And then the last group is the MK, uh, MKU English lecturers. Uh, the same, most of them also have a good command of English and also good language teaching skills because they usually are graduates from the Faculty of Teacher Education or the Faculty of uh, Humanities. But most of them do not have any experience in teaching ESP courses. Which, is, uh, which are now required by a lot of universities because they want their graduates to be ready uh, when they start their job. So what should, uh, uh, what, uh, what programs are actually needed by the lecturers in the higher education institution? Well, for the English lecturers, with the pandemic, it is true 
that now all lecturers are familiar with the use of technology to teach English in their classroom. But I think uh, uh, they still need more training on this area so that they can use more varied uh, tools uh, for teaching English in their classroom. And then the second uh, training that they also need is the training on how to integrate the 21st century skills into their English classes. Because with the era of globalization, we have to make sure that our graduates are ready to compete with graduates from other universities. And then because the government now has already uh, decided the level of language proficiency targeted for our graduates, it is really important, I think, to also provide training for our lecturers about formative assessment, which is in line with the CEFR, so that they can guarantee that the graduates can achieve the targeted level. And for the lecturers from the uh, Faculty of Teachers Education, I think breakthroughs in teachers education and training uh, well, uh, more training on this new breakthroughs in teachers' education and training is really needed for them. And for the subject lecturers, I think because the number of EMI classes are growing, more teachers are really interested in delivering their lessons also in English. But their level of proficiency is not the same as those who graduated from overseas. So if we really want to help them, it is really helpful, it is really useful if we can provide online EAP course to improve their English and also to increase their confidence in using English. And since they are very busy people, I think it's better if these EAP courses are designed for online because uh, they don't have time, I mean, to do the face-to-face -face training. And this is also true for the MKU, uh, MKU English lecturers. They also need some online uh, EAP courses so that they can learn uh, what kind of subjects are taught in an EAP course. And since uh, the study of the British Council conducted, uh, I think, uh, uh, well, uh, published last year shows that there was also evidence of poor practice where educational standards were compromised in the EMI classes because of the students' low level proficiency and also because lecturers are not familiar with how to deliver their lesson in English. It is also very important that we also provide trainings for the EMI teachers to know about the current EMI practices and the EMI pedagogy. And for the MKU English lecturers, I think it is also important to provide them with some training about the current development in the EAP or EOP practices, yeah, the English for Occupational Purposes. Another important uh, development at the university level is the fact that now the government assign each institution to produce these massive open online courses as part of the Campus Merdeka policy. And uh, uh, the Campus Merdeka policy offers students with freedom uh, to uh, collect credits for some courses based on their interests uh, and for the preparation of their future job. So at the moment, for example, in my university, we have already had the Business English Massive Open Online Courses and also the Public Speaking Massive Open Online Courses. But some other universities, I think they still need some help for producing this kind of courses. So this is also an area that I think can be uh, part of the uh, innovative programs that we can design together, uh, I think the Indonesian institution with the UK partner. 
So I can sum up that for uh, providing breakthrough in education at the higher level of institution, there are four big areas that should be the focus of our attention. The first one is English for academic purposes. This program is actually not only uh, important for lecturers who are uh, teaching in English, but also for lecturers who want to continue their study overseas. So by joining this program, they can improve their level, their English level proficiency, and uh, therefore they will be able to uh, do their study successfully. And then the second one, English for occupational purposes, is really needed for the uh, tertiary vocational institution and polytechnics if they want their graduates to be able to compete with other graduates from uh, other countries. Uh, at the moment, uh, this is not available in all institutions. So if it could be designed and could be offered to all uh, institutions, then that would be a very good innovation, I think for uh, improving the quality of graduates from Indonesia who will work and who will compete with other uh, employees, uh, with other graduates from other countries. And then another uh, area that I think we need to focus on is uh, the English as a medium of instruction. I think based on my uh, observation, there hasn't been any training which is designed for Indonesian lecturers. So uh, there is a, a MOOC available, a massive open online course, but it is for the general uh, public. Yeah, so if we can design uh, one program related to this, and it is really designed for Indonesian lecturers with their, uh, uh, well, uh, with their, uh, with things which are really special, yeah, which are really uh, can only be found in Indonesian context, that would be very good. And this also, again, should be available yeah, for all uh, institutions so that they can uh, improve the quality of teaching uh, in their double degree programs or in their joint degree program. And last but not least, as we have already listened to a lot of uh, presentation today, using technology in language teaching is something that we can't avoid. Yeah, so whether you want it or not, lecturers, I think at the university should integrate more uh, the, the use of technology in language teaching. So uh, th th this is something that I think is important at the higher level of education, because usually experienced uh, teachers uh, are, uh, are not very easy yeah, to adapt to the use of technology in their classroom. And I think if we can work together uh, uh, the partnership between Indonesian institution and also the UK institution. Yeah, we can uh, create programs, yeah, innovative programs that have, can help our learner, uh, our lecturers to improve uh, their teaching skills and also their English proficiency. It will be very useful for the Indone for Indonesia. If we cannot. Uh, strive for perfection, we can work together to strive for progress. I think that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu Cecil, for your presentation. Um, we are now going to the UK. We have Dr. Van der Viana here from the University of East Anglia. Um, he's an associate professor in education, Song. So, uh, Van der, over to you. That's grand. Thank you very much, Francis. Really nice to see all of you. And uh, uh, thanks for the British Council and the GIT for organizing this event. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Good afternoon to everyone in Indonesia and good morning for those of you who, like me, are in the UK. So I'm joining you today 
from a lovely city called Norwich in England. That's where I live and work. So you can see some pictures in here if you've never been uh, to Norwich. There is this kind of uh, uh, joint um, uh, feature of historical buildings and modern buildings with plenty of green spaces in the city and around the city. So as Francis was saying, I'm an associate professor at the University of East Anglia, uh, which is the university you can see right in the middle of your picture, surrounded by green area and the lake on our campus. And I work with um, uh, master's students and PhD students in the field of TSU and applied linguistics. So I've worked quite a long time as um, an English language teacher in my life um, and then moved into English language teacher education and also work as a researcher. So what I'll be talking to you today is based on my experience of working in collaboration with um, uh, colleagues um, across different countries. And you see some of them on your slide and obviously one of which is Indonesian. So at the moment I'm uh, conducting two different projects with Indonesian partners. Uh, who are always a pleasure to work with, and I look forward to working with more of you in going forward. And so, as you know, the event today is really dedicated to English language teacher professional development, and this is a vast area, an area that I mean, I've been working with for quite a, a number of years. So in my 10 minutes slot, what I will try to do is to focus on English language learning more specifically. And it's great to be following Cecilia uh, because there are lots of points of synergies between what she was saying and what I will be saying. I think both Cecilia and Steve yesterday uh, reinforced this need for English language proficiency. Cecilia just now uh, was talking about uh, uh, the target of having B2 and C1 levels. And, uh, for lectures in Indonesia. So my focus here is really on how technology can help us lecturers or as students or as users of English to enhance our knowledge of the English language. So uh, as I said, I mean, I've worked as an English language teacher for quite a while and I still work with lots of masters and PhD students uh, who keep asking questions about English. So for instance, these two examples I'm bringing you here are from my own experience, uh, questions that I've been asked. Uh, for instance, what kind of verb do you use with questionnaires? So when you want to say you are going to distribute your questionnaires, you're going to hand out your questionnaires, do you say, for instance, you are going to apply your questionnaires? Or when you use the phrase, for instance, the key to do something or the key to doing something, which one do you use? Can you use both? Is there a difference between them? So these are questions that we uh, ask ourselves, that we get asked all the time. And what I would like to think about here is really, what do we do to try and solve these questions? So we'd just like to add some sort of interactivity, if I may, in my presentation. I know that there are loads of people here uh, uh, following this presentation today. So if you could perhaps go to Slido just now, uh, slido.com, and if you could add the code you see on your screen, 857471, and if you could answer this question. So what or who do you consult most often when you have English language doubts? And, so who or what do you go to to answer questions like the previous two I showed you? Do you go to colleagues, peers and teachers? Do you look these points up in dictionaries? Do you go to grammar books, to textbooks? What is it that, uh, that you use? What resources do you use uh, to help you solve these, um, um, these doubts of yours? I'll just give you a few uh, minutes, uh, well, seconds actually, to try and answer this question. And you can see that, man, as you answer, the total automatically um, changes here on our screen. Results keep coming in, but what you can see here is that, I mean, most people, uh, they seem to be going to other people. And so they go to colleagues, to peers, to teachers uh, in order uh, to help them with their English language doubts. Uh, 
And if we think about resources, material resources, then most people seem to be going to dictionaries and to answer their doubts. And what I'll be talking to you about today is just showing one example from my experience of using a resource that is available out there that we can uh, take advantage of, which is called corpora, which some of you have answered that many you do use, 19% of you. So if I may, I will just move over now. Yeah, so uh, what I'll be discussing here is basically how we can use corpora in English language education. And that is a topic that I have been working on for quite a number of years. Um, and I've been discussing that, for instance, in two recent publications, one uh, in relation to ESP in my 2018 book, but there is also a new book that is almost hot off the press that is going to be available next um, uh, January in 2022 on the use of corpus linguistics for English for academic purposes. So when we are talking about corpora, what is a corpus? Basically, it is a collection of texts and uh, uh, it allows us to see how language is used. Um, now, these collections of texts are really large. So we're talking about, for instance, one billion words um, in the case of a corp the corpus of contemporary American English and over 13 billion words for the news on the web corpus. And I'm not saying you are going to analyze these corpora uh, by hand. No, not at all. So we have computer tools to help us do that. And one thing that was mentioned both yesterday and today is the need to rely on mobile technologies. And that's totally fine. I mean, you can access these large collections of corpora with very little bandwidth being required and through your mobile phones, for instance. So if I may go back um, to one of the examples I shared with you earlier on, that question about what verb is this that you use with questionnaires? And so this actually comes from a sentence that was written by an advanced uh, student of English for academic purposes who was writing uh, his research proposal, what he was planning to do. And you can see the original example in here where the student wrote, the questionnaires will be applied to postgraduate students in the 2015-16 year. So the question is, can we really say apply with questionnaires? Is that the verb that we use when we want to convey that idea? Well, if we look up apply uh, being used together with questionnaire in COCA, which is the Contemporary Corpus of American English, containing 1 billion words, and we only find 14 cases of apply together with questionnaire that kind of uh, bring some sort of anxiety, doesn't it? I mean, only 14 instances? Is that really the way uh, most people say it? Um, so what we can do very easily uh, in a couple of few seconds is basically look it up. And rather than doing that live, and in order to try to save time, I will just play a short video to show you how that can be done. So all you need to do is to go to the, for instance, in this case, so one of the resources we've got to the Corpus of Contemporary American English. You type the words you're looking for, in this case, questionnaire, and then you will see the collocates. And so we see complete, administer, fill. In this new screen, you can go and ask for more examples. So here you have loads of examples of the verb administer being used to get with questionnaire providing students with lots of input, lots of language input to understand how this verb can be used with this noun. And I could go on and on uh, giving more examples to you. As I said, I mean, this for me is a fascinating area that I mean, I've been working with teachers uh, around the world to develop their knowledge and also their students' knowledge. But I'm afraid I'm running uh, out of time, so I won't be discussing the second example, which is the key to do or the key to doing, but I'll leave that as homework. So if you're interested in finding whether it's one or the other, you could perhaps look that up yourself, or I'm very happy to discuss that later on. So what I would like to highlight in here uh, to try and summarize this kind of example I'm bringing to you today is that there is a way in which we can use technology, I mean, 
uh, we've become more familiarized with it. With we know how to use it much more nowadays than we used to know before the pandemic. Uh, and we can use this technology to help us and our students develop our English language journey, our English language learning, to help us on this journey of learning English, which is a continuous journey. I mean, it doesn't stop, really. And it's not only about people who speak English as a second or a foreign language, it's about everyone. So one thing that research has shown us is that our intuitions about how language is used do not really match how language is used. So we really need to look at these examples and analyze them. Uh, as I understand it from yesterday, developing independence is one of the critical skills that um, uh, the educational sector in Indonesia is trying to develop. And corporate can help us uh, develop that kind of independence, uh, independent learning, autonomous learning with students and, and teachers and lecturers. And it also helps us develop our critical skills because we go beyond the mere act of thinking, oh, well, I think this is the way we say it. Well, it sounds natural, it doesn't sound natural. It makes us look at texts. It makes us look at how language is used. It makes us think whether that's really natural or not. Mm -hmm. um, so I will stop here uh, so that we have time at the end for a discussion. Thank you very much for that. That was great. Thank you, Vander, for sharing that um, interesting. And also, I also enjoyed the interactive part of your presentation. We come to the last um, speakers. We have two speakers joining us from University of Southampton. We have Mary Page and Dr. Rob Bird, Senior Teaching Fellow of the University of Southampton. I believe in the chat, I read um, one or two teachers are joining a program from your university. So I'm sure they're excited to see or hear or listen for, from someone from that university. Um, time is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Francis. And hello from the University of Southampton and very many sincere thanks to all the people who've made this wonderful event possible. Thank you. So we are uh, Rob Baird and Mary Page. We both teach at the University of Southampton and we've both been working in EME for approximately 15 years. So that's uh, researching EME and training university academics in EME, uh, both in country and in Southampton and both in person and online. So today, we'd like to tell you very briefly about our exciting online teacher development project with the British Council, which is just starting now. And this is starting in the Philippines. So here we go. This is our current work. Um, so this is a quick overview of the project and later, Rob will um, dig down a little bit more deeply into some of the aspects um, of this project. So it's, as you can see, it's professional development in EME, and it's aimed at an audience of academics in the Philippines. The universities in question have selected a total of 50 participants who we will work with to become master trainers. Um, our task then is to enable these academics to cascade to other academics in their locality. And to do this, we have created a framework, a framework which will be expandable and sustainable so that after the project finishes, the universities in the Philippines will still have this solid framework for the further training of yet more academics in EME practices. And all of this, of course, will be online, both synchronous and asynchronous. So how are we able to do this? Well, we decided to use our MOOC, English as a Medium of Instruction for Academics, as the starting point. We created this MOOC five years ago, and it's already run 13 times on the FutureLearn platform. And it's already reached thousands of academics 
all over the world and it enables them to dialogue with one another. However, the MOOC is not the training course. It's only the beginning of our course in the Philippines. We are embedding it as the foundation and then we're adding to it um, extra synchronous and asynchronous activities and materials. We're building in different technologies and we are demonstrating how a MOOC might be embedded in a program. And this points the way to future ways of delivering education. So we are thinking long term here about you know, the rest of the 21st century. What are we going to be doing in the future? At the same time, we are looking after the individual and we're supporting the master trainers as they transition from trainees to trainers. So we start with the MOOC, international, global and generic, and then focus down on the minutiae of the local. Here is a Z map um, from the last run of the MOOC, which just shows you the locations of the individuals um, following the MOOC and therefore the people who can interact with one another as they dialogue. Um, if you've been following closely, um, you may well have some questions in mind. Notably, you may be wondering why we're using the term EME rather than EMI, which is the usual term. Well, EME indicates our approach and our thinking. The word instruction suggests top-down, teacher-led focus, when in fact, we are committed to the education of all. So it's not just a question of what the teacher says and what the teacher does, but it's a, a holistic approach to all the players in a given environment or setting. Um, we're actually quite humble about this in a way, because when we're talking of, um, um, and working with educators in localities that we know very, very little about, we would not be so bold as to tell them how to teach their subject matter and how to talk to their students, because they are the experts, not us. So we are therefore facilitators um, and the approach is learning centered rather than learner centered or teacher centered. So we consider ourselves to be facilitators and what we aim to do is create a safe space in which educators can explore their ideas um, freely and with no fear. At the same time, we believe that we are playing to the strengths of online education. It's not second best, as some would have it. Um, in this context, it's an excellent vehicle for teacher development on a large scale. And with technology, um, academics can, can break through the geographical boundaries um, and form uh, support groups. And this is what we will be doing with and for our colleagues, our new colleagues in the Philippines. So it's not just professional development, it's continuing professional development. Anyway, over to you, Rod. Thank you, Mary. And hello, everybody. Um, yes, yeah, so I'd just like to take you through a couple of slides, um, just elaborating on some of the challenges that we perceive both in this environment and also in our experience of, de of engaging with English medium education in different contexts around the world and then um, outlying what we're trying to do on this program specifically. Um, so one of the major challenges we find is perceptions of English medium education and what people bring to that, because sometimes it's a term that people think they understand in the same way. And when you try to um, engage with continuing professional development or training courses, you realize people people focus on different things or people have different concerns or even envision the, the role of being an English medium educator differently. 
And one area of that is this second point here about language proficiency. And lots of people, when you switch the focus to English, they bring with them a lot of ways of thinking about language and performing and concerns about, um, about their role and how they, how they will be perceived by students, for example, in terms of language proficiency. And sometimes shifting the focus to communication and particularly intercultural communication, use of technology, pedagogy, and disciplinary language practices, which are really important, obviously, in English medium education settings. One of the major barriers is this perception of language proficiency. I need to be fluent. I need to have correct grammar. I'm going to be judged on my kind of superficial performance rather than what Mary was saying, you know, what learning is taking place? What are you asking students to do? And linked to that is that third point about confidence and self-belief. This is consistently one of the biggest barriers and also one of the biggest breakthroughs that we've experienced in, in the 15 years we've had engaging with English medium education, that uh, people who lack confidence in what they're doing will be less effective in an educational environment. You know, it's hard to focus on, on learning and facilitating student progress when you're lacking confidence in your own communicative abilities or teaching abilities. So scaffolding that and having this as an ongoing focus for teachers is very important. Um, also, lots of concerns on a practical level around the work and the preparation involved in conti continuing professional development programs. So here we're entering the Philippines and it, one of the questions we had immediately was how much time do people have? How much effort can people devote to this program? Um, and another question we always ask when going into a new environment is about what can and cannot be changed. Because a big problem in professional development is suggesting practices and processes um, that cannot actually be achieved in that setting. Or if the institution doesn't allow certain practices in that environment, it can be very challenging. So those are, that's just a flavor of some of um, the considerations we have. And if I just, elaborate on the framework that Mary put forward. So our uh, program in the Philippines will be focusing on preparation. So we've got a preparation week and then people will engage with the MOOC that we have, which as Mary said, is a coming together. It's a dialogue around themes such as, you know, what is the English of English medium education? What does it look like? You know, how does communication work? Um, also things like um, you know, lecturing, using slides effectively to engage with an international audience who are probably using English as a second language. What do you need to think about? What do you need to consider? Things um, beyond the classroom. What can you do outside of the classroom to facilitate learning inside the classroom? So lots of things like this are the focus of the MOOC and we're trying to focus in on what, what is contextually useful, what would be useful in this uh, Philippine context that people can elaborate on, add to, engage with, which links to part two, which is where the master trainers will create bespoke materials um, for local needs. So they're going to be um, engaging with English medium educators in their regions so they're going to take the resources we have, possibly add to them, adapt them, and create a profile of training materials that will be localized, that will be appropriate for that setting, but informed by the discussion they're having globally on the MOOC. Um, we're then going to roll out the teacher development program. So they're going to engage with educators in their environments. They will be having their first attempt at being a master trainer. And <laughs> yeah, so as, I, as Mary said, that will be a thousand people um, impacted by this program. And again, it's a sustainable cycle. So they will be able to train another thousand in future. And um, yeah, obviously it can develop from there. So this is a seed for, a, for ongoing development in this area. And um, some of the areas we focus on, uh, in terms of assessing 
how well people perform and whether they achieve what they need to achieve as master trainers. So they have to demonstrate understanding of, of issues in English medium education. They have to complete the tasks we set them on the program. They have to produce training materials collaboratively, um, so individually as well, but we focus particularly on collaboration around that. Um, analytical reflections, so engaging it with what they've done, um, demonstrating the thought process that goes into that and why this is localized, why this is appropriate for their settings, and also anything that they tried to do but it didn't quite work and they would have to adapt. That's something that the whole program can learn from. And also the quality of training evidence. So they have to evidence that they have impacted in their local environment. Um, so that's a quick flavor and we're happy to take questions about that at the end. Um, if you're interested in reading more about that, we've got um, a couple of articles, a chapter and a link to the MOOC for people who um, wish to have a look at that. And these are our contact details if you want to get in touch with us. Um, and yeah, the two images there, the FutureLearn platform. And also that's, that's created a large community on Facebook as well. I can't remember, Mary, do you know how many people are in our little Facebook group now? Um, I think it's 1,200. Right. So yeah, that's, but it, it's wonderful to see people are interested in this. People want to get together. They want to engage. They want to be in this global dialogue. And um, so yeah, uh, do you're welcome to join and see what other people are discussing. So we will finish there and say thank you very much. And as I said, we're happy to take any questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary and Rob. Um, we have time for panel discussion and I would like to bring all the panelists back um, if they can be spotlighted and I would like to invite questions if you have questions to um, Dr. Cecilia Halimi, Dr. Van der Vienna, Mary Page and Dr. Robert, Rob, Rob Beard, you are welcome to do so by posting your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, in the meantime, I have questions for um, Mary and Rob. What are the main things that you have learned so far in your program? So much. <laughs> okay. Um, but everybody is different. Everyone is in a different setting and um, has to have the self-belief and the strength to make the decisions and do what is appropriate for their students and I would, briefly. Yeah. And I would add, I, I'd say what I learn every time we engage with English medium educators is how, or how strong the community is, like how good people are, like people working in universities are incredibly talented, communicative, and collegial people in general. Students are here to learn, you know, it's a very productive environment and, the, and it's a very supportive environment. And when people engage with the human element of higher education, I think that's, that's why we enjoy be, being in this field is, you know, we yes. get constantly surprised how, how engaging and how, how lovely people are in, in their own way. And, they can bring out this communication and this effectiveness in very different ways, as Mary said. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yes, I Thank think it's, it's wonderful that you still learn as well and you're sharing with the teachers, yeah? yeah. Okay, yes. how about uh, Ibu Sisir, how about you and uh, what you've been doing in, uh, at the University of Indonesia? Well, Francis, sorry, I had a problem before. What was your oh, question? Okay, the question is, what have you learned so far from doing your um, uh, programs in the capacity building for your lecturers there? Okay, well, I think uh, based on my experience in our university, actually, they are very uh, enthusiastic yeah, in learning new things and everything. And uh, this is something which is very good because it means that uh, we can always uh, what uh, offer new programs for them here, yeah? uh, and uh, the problem is again they don't have 
a lot of time. So I think uh, the solution for designing the program in the form of online course is something uh, that I think is the solution for this. Because when it is a face-to-face -face session, it is hard for them to allocate their time between teaching and then professional development and etc. So if we can, uh, with this pandemic, I think we have a lot of ideas yeah, that we can integrate in the uh, uh, lecturer's professional development, I think. Okay, you mentioned uh, online, so I would like to go uh, probably vendor uh, for you. What are the main challenges for uh, online teacher training uh, and what are the main advantages other than you can reach people far from your place? Thank you, Francis. Yes, well, I think one of the main ch main challenges that we see uh, in the research we have done on the back of the professional uh, development courses that we have offered is basically what colleagues have already said, is time, having the time to dedicate to do something. But I would uh, second what colleagues have said, uh, personal investment is really important. I mean, we what we see working with teachers, working with students is that they are invested, they are interested in developing. Uh, they have a natural curiosity and I think uh, uh, that shouldn't be taken for granted. Uh, the fact that I mean, people are curious, people want to learn more than people are, even though they have challenges time-wise uh, with, I mean, their workloads, teaching large classes, lo teaching lots of classes. Uh, I think that's a very positive thing. Um, as you said earlier on, I mean, in terms of, um, of the, uh, in addition to the number of people that we can reach, I think the online provision also helps us to congregate, congregate at different places. I mean, we probably wouldn't be able to be holding this event if we had to be all in the same place today just because of restrictions. Uh, but even if there were no restrictions, I mean, think about uh, the time, the effort, and the money involved in that, not to say the environmental considerations of I mean, everyone traveling to the same place. Um, so I think that there are positives as well for us to think about. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, we do have uh, questions here now for um, the panelists, but I don't think uh, we have time. Let me check with the time. Oh, okay, well, we have one more. I think we can do one more uh, from Ivo um, Irene. If time and resources are limited, what should be the first priority in TPD? Impro improving English skills or teaching skills? This is this goes to all of you. Teaching skills. Teaching <laughs> skills. Okay, yeah. English Cecilia also agree teaching skills. Well, it really depends. If I think the proficiency level of our lecturers is uh, not very good, then I think that should be the first priority. But I think at the university level, maybe this is not really a big problem. So we can focus on the teaching skills. Okay. Fender, you want to say something? Uh, well, I would agree with Cecilia, I mean, I think it's more a one-to-one -one, um, kind of reflection that people need to take, I mean, where their skills are, where they need to develop. It's very difficult to roll out something that is applicable to everyone. Um, so I would encourage people to engage reflection, which was mentioned in the previous session, to decide what works best for them. Okay, well, thank you so much for sharing what you have been doing in the teacher professional development and higher education, particularly with the EMI, uh, EME, as you say in Southampton <laughs> there. Thank you so much. We, that concludes the second session of the day. And um, ladies and gentlemen, attendees, we have one last session and I believe in the Q&A box, there are many questions about the grants. So you might wanna stay tuned and you can ask your questions and Colm will answer the questions. So we're gonna take a short break and we'll be back with the question and answer session on UK ID digital innovation grants. Ladies and gentlemen, let's say um, appreciate the speakers by clapping our hands digitally. You can type clap, clap, clap in the chat or you can give your reaction. Thank you so much, Dr. Robert, Mary Page, Dr. Cecilia Halimi and Dr. Vander um, for your presentation. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the last session of today. This is probably the most anticipated session because if you look at the Q&A box, um, many questions are about the grants. So this is your opportunity. Um, where uh, Calm Don't, the Director, uh, English Education and Society, British Council of Indonesia, will answer your dying questions about the grant, uh, about the UK ID Digital Innovation Grants that was launched yesterday. So, Calm, over to you. Thank you very much, Francis. Salamat Samoa. Um, good afternoon, everybody in Indonesia, and good morning to everybody in the UK. Thank you very much for staying with us, for your strength. It's been a long uh, afternoon, really inspiring. It's all been recorded. So if you've missed anything, you will be able to watch the recording and share that with your colleagues. Um, this session is scheduled for 15 minutes. We may go slightly over. Nobody has to stay, but I will stay and answer questions. It's just the first opportunity to sort of have some questions about our grants and there will be others. Um, yesterday, I gave a presentation about the new UK Indonesia digital innovation grants. So if you missed that, then my first recommendation would be to, we'll, I'll ask a colleague to put a link in the chat, is to have a look at that presentation. What I thought I would do very briefly is, I'm gonna spend about five minutes giving a quick recap of some of the key um, facts, and then we can take questions because I might cover some of your questions in that way. So I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, we're going to start off with some slides, and there's a few new ones here. Let me go to the beginning. Um, so the first thing I wanted to say, and this is slightly different, is that we are very keen to get some feedback from all of you about the webinars today, about our launch. Um, so throughout this session, there's a QR code and a link. There's lots of links, I'm afraid. But um, uh, they're all useful. There is a, a, this is a code for feedback. I'll share that again at the end of this Q&A session. Um, this is a very important part of the, uh, what we're trying to achieve this week is to develop more partnerships between the UK and Indonesia. And this is something new today. So if you see this link at the bottom, if you go to this link, um, and I think we might be able even to share a copy of this at the moment as a PDF in the chat. But what it is, it's a booklet that our colleagues at DIT, Department for International Trade from the UK, have been putting together of the companies and universities and consultants from the UK um, that wanted to appear in that booklet. Um, 
and although we have already designed it very nicely and we're going to share it with you now um, if you are in the UK and you want to be in this booklet you still have a chance there's a link there uh, a purple one slightly different um, and we are giving you until Friday to complete the form uh, send us your company your organization's details and we're going to update that booklet um, next week Similarly, if you are in Indonesia, if you're a university or you're an ELT uh, organization or an ed tech company, and you're interested in being a partner in these grant schemes, and you would like us to share your details with the UK, we are going to create a similar document. It won't be um, quite as colorful as the UK booklet, but we will be um, putting together um, your contact details. So again, the same time in Indonesia in this case, could you complete that? We have about 10 Indonesian um, that have completed this link. Next, some details, quick details. So this is what I presented yesterday to say that our grants are now live. Um, they were launched yesterday. This is the link to our British Council website where you can find all of the documents. This is the main one that you can read, uh, which details what we are um, looking for proposals for, what the objectives of these grants are, what the eligibility uh, criteria um, are, what the deadlines and the timeline for delivery are, um, all of the sort of requirements in order to submit your proposal should be all in this document, along with the forms for you to complete. And as I've said, we are looking for UK Indonesian partners to design, develop, pilot and evaluate a new TPD resource. So uh, uh, some training material, a course that is going to support the development of English teachers, both in schools and in universities in Indonesia. And as you can see at the bottom, we particularly keen to have uh, proposals that are also going to help um, teachers who are living in remote and rural areas who maybe don't have as easy access to a strong internet connection um, as people living in cities. So I, I, again, that was yesterday's presentation, just a reminder, that we don't have a fixed number of grants, um, but in those three categories I just shared, we are interested in awarding between two to three um, proposals with funding. Um, and at the moment, we have put a, uh, an amount of 50,000 pounds for each individual grant. So if you can imagine, there could well be five, six, um, seven possibly different projects running next year. Um, the plan is for these projects to run from January to March 2023, so 14 months. But with the decisions, that, you know, we will be making a decision in November and then distributing the first payment of the grant to the successful um, applicants in December. I think I'm about to get to the Q&A. Just a brief reminder of the timeline and that we've launched yesterday. Uh, I'm going to give you another link to ask questions. You can send us lots of questions. We're definitely going to have a long Q&A on the 19th for people. Um, this is a, a shorter one. We may do some other briefing sessions, but this is the only one we've confirmed at the moment. The big date for most people to be aware of is that the deadline is the 9th of November for submitting your, your proposal. And then these are uh, how we will, you know, the time we will need to evaluate and make a decision, and then aiming to sign an agreement in December and get going. Um, I think I'm going to stick with this screen for a minute, and then I'm going to look at the questions. So. This is, uh, there's two links on the page. Again, this is one link 
for feedback on this session. If you, if I don't get to your question today, there is a question within the feedback, which is tell us uh, your question so we, we can develop a Q&A or an FAQ um, form um, answering any most of the main questions. So I need to look at the chat and I might ask Francis to help me a little bit. I'm going to go through the questions. I think you can see my screen when I do this. Okay, so I'm going to just go through the questions I can see. And I'll answer them live. This is the Q&A box. The requirements, Kumari, Kumar, Kumara or Kamaria, all of the requirements to get the grant are in this document. And there are uh, a few requirements, but I'm going to say, go and have a, there's too many just to answer in that format. So I have answered that live. Um, that I think is not a question for the grants, but it's a question that <laughs> we've got a MOOC running on that right at the moment. You could go and have a look. Um, okay, I'm just going to scroll through again. Uh, this is Indriati has asked, what are the things that need to be included in the grant proposal? Uh, again, I would recommend that you look at the document uh, on the website. Um, and Nudalia Nuda 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 is asking about English for medical professionals. And I would say tomorrow there is a specific expert. The UK's expert in medical English is on tomorrow's schedule. So come back tomorrow to find out more um, in that area. Let me have a look. Maybe I will look at the chat. I'm going to ask. Francis, can you help me with any questions um, that you can see that it would be useful for me to answer? Some people are raising their hands, so I'm wondering if we can almost let people speak. I'm quite happy to do that. Francis, can you tell me any specific questions that you've seen? Oh, our question's coming in. There is one question, Tom, about uh, is that grant also for primary teachers, for individual or just organization? Okay, so one of the requirements, the people who, to be honest, this type of grant is for organizations it could be an individual, but it would have to be an in individual with a lot of experience in writing and designing effective teacher professional development resources. Um, and I think that that individual would probably be part of a, you know, would have to be, you know, the other participant, not participant, um, the other sort of institution or would would certainly be kind of a, a well-known, well-established like English language teaching and training organization, company or institution. I think we would, uh, unless that individual had fantastic um, evidence of their ability to design um, very effective teacher professional development resources that are used at scale, uh, maybe in other countries uh, or in Indonesia nationally. Obviously, if, if there's an individual that has they, that kind of background, then we would be interested in, in something that they would submit. Um, but usually, I think we would expect to find that kind of experience within um, a university or with an, an e or an edtech company or an ELT private company like the, the ones that featured in session two this afternoon. Thanks, Pak. Okay, thank you. But that was a question from Pak Rusidi. Yeah, so maybe the individuals could be working together with universities, you know, um, or with other organizations as part of a collective proposal. How about uh, MKMP? Because MKMP is mandatory. It's a lot of MKMP uh, growing up in Indonesia. 
uh, that kind of organization, is that possible to apply for the grant? Yes. Um, I think there's two things to say there. One is we want to develop resources that are going to fit into existing Ministry of Education initiatives um, for teacher training. So as yesterday, there was the, the DG from the Ministry of Education, um, Dr. Iwan Sharil, and talked about the fantastic innovations uh, that the ministry is taking in online provision. Um, and earlier today, uh, Ibu Ija Khodira talked about the professional development sort of mechanisms um, that are in place at the moment for teachers. Um, and I would say that we want to, although we might be a private company or a private organization or a university developing resources, we want to make sure that those resources fit into these existing mechanisms. And, and if one of the applicants happens to be a government agency responsible for the management or delivery of those professional development um, systems, then certainly we would welcome working uh, and supporting a proposal to, to do that directly. Does that answer the question? Yeah, okay, thank you. Because uh, I think it's a lot of people, uh, teachers here belong to MKNP for sure. Yeah, in that, in that area, yeah. Thank you, Pak Hong. Um, Come on, we have one question. Do we, do we, by Santi the study, just a quick question. Do we have to select a partner listed in the booklet? No, not at all. I would say, look, the booklet is designed to work in two ways. One is um, very simply, it's a booklet uh, that will help you get a, a, an insight into the range of different ELT expertise in the UK. Um, and you might want to use that booklet just as a, like, if you're a university or a school in Indonesia and you wanted some specific teacher training needs, then you could use that booklet and you could contact them directly for those needs. Um, but also you might be thinking about a proposal for this grant and think, oh, I've got an idea. Um, I would like to explore maybe I want to find a partner who might be interested in working with me on this idea. I'm sure the companies and consultants listed in that booklet would be open to those kind of conversations to see if something, you know, if there's an alignment in the, the idea and strategy. And this is how some of these proposals could be, could, could come together. Okay. But, but the question was, sorry, you don't have to pick somebody from the book. From the list. You okay. could find somebody not in the list, um, and that's absolutely fine as well. If completely. Okay. Uh, people are typing the questions in the chat, and it might be difficult uh, to track. But how about non-formal teacher? Can I apply to? It's not really. This is not really a grant for. As I said, unless you are an individual and a like unbelievably amazing individual that has managed to write professional development resources that are used kind of nationally, I think it would be unlikely. Um, that you would be successful in a proposal. You could, you could submit a proposal. Two individuals, one from Indonesia, one from the UK could. I think it's not really, that um, there are grants or more sort of schemes for individuals. Um, sort of, it's not sort of a particular, it's not, for example, an individual training uh, grant. Um, this is really an opportunity to work on something that is gonna be of national, um, uh, support, if you like, impact. Okay, but teachers can join the program if they get the grant and they create uh, the program. And well, what I would say is all, we want all teachers to join the outputs of these grants. So these grants right. are going to produce courses that are going to be exciting, they're going to be mm -hmm. interesting, they're going to be innovative, they're going to be attractive, they're going to be relevant to Indonesian teachers. Right. They're going to, you know, we want these are the, what these grants are for are to develop the programs next year that in 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, we hope all teachers are going to be doing the programs. So it's all for teachers. Um, and yeah, that's the that's the idea. So we want teachers to join the outcomes. Maybe teachers could volunteer to be uh, to test these innovations next right. summer as they're being developed. 
we right. need feedback from teachers to get it right. We need feedback and the partners who are developing the resources will need to pilot everything to make sure that it's relevant. Okay, so don't be discouraged. If you cannot apply, you can still benefit from the grants, yeah, teachers. Uh, one last question, uh, Kong. Can one institution apply with two different partnerships? Yeah, I might need to clarify exactly the wording in our documents, because I know it says like the main um, partner in the UK and the main partner in Indonesia, but definitely we welcome kind of joint uh, proposals from multiple parties so for example it could be three or four organizations decide to come together and that is that's absolutely fine okay all right i think we don't have any more questions people are saying goodbye sorry they have to leave for another meeting thank you for staying for these three hours um i wanted to oh, you're gonna I, yeah you, you go can I ask um, the, the schedule for the clarification meeting? Because yesterday you mentioned that there will be a, a meeting uh, for people who still have doubts about their proposals that they can consult. Uh, can, you, uh, can you mention the, the date for that? Well, we're definitely going to have one on the 19th of October. Okay. And like that feedback form that I just shared the QR code to, um, we're going to analyze like the feedback that we get from today and maybe the feedback that we get from tomorrow and maybe emails, you know, when people start to get in touch with us and we'll start to better understand what kind of clarity is needed um, and, and how best to do that, whether we need to do something just for Indonesian audience or just for the UK audience or another way of trying to bring the UK and Indonesia together. But thank you again so much for everybody who's joined today. It's been really smooth. Thank you, Francis, for moderating. And thanks, Tor and Aital. Um, we've, we've almost finished. I can't remember doing an online webinar where everything seems to have gone so smoothly. Um, <laughs> we, have, we have one more. We have, we have one last slide to remind um, participants to come back tomorrow for our third and final session of the series. So um, if you haven't followed the uh, Instagram, uh, the social media, you might want to check this flyer for tomorrow's session. Thank you so much, panelists um, and participants who stay until the end. I can see in the panelist box, we still have people from the first session staying in until the end. So thank you so much. Good afternoon and good morning still probably in the UK. See you tomorrow. Oh, the screen, the share screen is not really working. Ah, there you go.